There we go. Uh, so what, first I'm just going to set some context. So uh, at Ocado, we're in the business of online grocery shopping. Uh, so the problem we're trying to solve is to enable our customers to come online and um, do their food grocery shopping with us uh, and then have it delivered to their house when they want. So a typical customer will order about 50 items, uh, some things off the shelf like bread, some things out the fridge like milk, maybe some ice cream from the freezer, and then they'll choose a slot when they want it delivered to their house. So it's not like uh, any other e-commerce website where it might come tomorrow or the day after. They can choose one hour slots, any time from 5.30 in the morning to 11.30 at night, to get, it, to get those 50 items delivered exactly when they want. And so Ocado are the world's largest only online grocery retailer. And we're currently serving about 700,000 customers. Uh, and we offer them a range of around 55,000 different products. And how we're different from most other grocery companies is that we don't have any shops. We operate purely out of three large distribution centers in the UK. Uh, and on average, we're serving those customers around just under 300,000 orders a week. So that's a bit of scene setting. Uh, so we have three warehouses in the UK, uh, but we're going international. So along the top line, there are some of our brands in the UK that we sell under. And there's just a selection of companies that we're going to be selling our solution or have sold our solution to across the world and are going to be using what I'm going to show you today. Uh, to today. So here's a video of the magic that powers our online grocery operation. So everything you see here is basically being developed in-house at Ocado Technology. Uh, these robots whiz around at four meters a second. Uh, they're running on top of a grid, which is about two stories high. Uh, so those white containers you can see there are stacked 21 high. Uh, and the robots are about the size of a washing machine. So they're about that big. Uh, and they pick up the products inside them. They move them around. Uh, and they take the products to people who put together our customer orders. Uh, so you can see uh, they're wireless, they run on batteries. Uh, we had to develop our own wireless communication protocol to uh, handle this many number of robots in such a tight space. Uh, and we're using Java to control all these robots and tell them where to go, what to do, and make most efficient use of them. People want to see that again? No. Oh. There we go. So they can, they can carry around 35 kilograms of weight. Uh, like I said, they move at four meters a second. They communicate at 10 times a second uh, with our control system. Uh, yeah, I'll, just, I'll let you enjoy that for a minute before I carry on. <laughs> Yeah, you can probably see they pass between each other within five millimeters. So it's about that much. And they whiz past each other. Uh, what else is there to say about them? I mean, there's lots. <laughs> yeah. Ah, that's it. Uh, you, can't, you don't really get a sense of scale in this video. But in our biggest installation, it's the size of three football pitches. If you stand at one end, you actually can't really see the other end. It just kind of almost goes on forever. And there's about 3,000 robots running on that. On that. So it's, it's massive scale. So this is me. I'm Matthew Cornford. I'm technology leader at Ocado Technology. I've been working on this system for about three years. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, well, you can follow me at Buffalo or Ocado Technology. Or you can follow our, our Sophia office here, Ocado Tech BG. So this is a diagram of that system I just showed you. And it just highlights some of the components in the warehouse that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is very simplistic. doesn't encompass everything that goes on in, in our warehouse. But we have a control system uh, that's written in Java. Uh, oh, where are we going? Over here. That runs in our data center. Uh, like I said, we've developed a 4G-based proprietary wireless protocol to communicate with our robots. And then our robots are you are running embedded C code on them, which we write. And we also develop the hardware for our robots as well. So I'm going to cover three main areas today. I'm going to give you an introduction to simulation and determinism and why that's important for us. 
I'm going to share with you some of the optimizations we've performed to make our control systems as efficient as possible. And then I'm going to give you a bit of a use case on how we use Java to test our robot software. So simulation. Does anyone here have any practice, experience, or know what simulation is, apart from the people that work at Ocado? <laughs> cool, a few people, not a lot. So this is from Wikipedia. This is the first line of the Wikipedia article. And a simulation is a, an approximate imitation of the operation of a process or system, and the act of simulating first requires that a model is developed. Uh, that's my highlighting in bold there. So some of you look too young to probably understand what, or recognize what these are. <laughs> Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, and The Sims. So these are examples of simulations. Uh, hopefully you can see they're, they're approximate imitations. They're not real. Uh, they're modeling some real-world process or system. So in the case of Flight Simulator flying a plane, or the system in The Sims is the world. And you can imagine if you were developing this, say, Flight Simulator, you would have to devise a model, probably using some physics-based model, to determine how your plane's going to fly in the air, what's going to happen when you send it and try and stall it. Uh, so that kind of highlights that definition of what simulation is. And so why do we use simulation? Well, there, there's three main reasons, really, why we might use simulation. One is it allows us to test our software extensively without needing real hardware. Um, we really wouldn't want to test our software for the first time on real hardware, because we're likely to break it, and that's expensive. Uh, so by having a simulation of our warehouse, we can regularly test our software uh, in the confines of our office without needing to have physical hardware. Secondly, it lets us uh, test out new algorithms and perform some research. So if we have an idea for a new algorithm which make, we think might make our system better, then we can test that in our simulation environment. And thirdly, it allows us to uh, validate new designs of warehouses. So a team may want to, uh, we may want to build a new warehouse, and a team will design it, and they will think it's going to do so much capacity, but they want to verify it before they actually start the building project. You don't want to spend millions of pounds to build one of these things to find out you've got the design slightly wrong. So we can run our actual software and our real production code against our simulation and against the new design and validate whether it's working or not and whether it's performing to how we expect the design to perform. So here's an... Oh, oh sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, so what are the sorts of things that we would simulate in our system? Well, if we were wanting to test our Java control system, we would basically simulate everything around it. So we'd simulate other software systems, uh, because we don't want to test our whole warehouse stack in once. We want to kind of just test an isolated bit. Uh, and we're also running our simulations for many, many days as well. So we can't just use mocks or stubs, because the amounts of inputs and outputs that you'd have to hard code would be horrendous. So we simulate other software systems, mimic their core behavior, so that we can perform our testing separately from those other teams and not have integration challenges. We simulate hardware. So the robots I showed you, we'd have a model in our software uh, which will simulate some of the behavior of a, a robot. And we simulate people as well. Uh, believe it or not, we do still have people in our warehouses. The robots haven't taken over everything yet, although that's our plan. Uh, so, so the, the acts and the processes that people do, how, how they perform their actions, we will simulate as well. So we get a good understanding of how our system performs in, in the presence of humans as well. So I'll show you another example, like moving away from Flight Simulator and The Sims. Uh, and so one of the things we want to simulate, I said, is our robots. And you saw they run in two directions, in the x-axis and the y-axis. And so we might want to model how they move in one direction. So here we've got a graph of speed versus time. And the real world speed profile might look something like this. So I'm going to have to move over here, I think. Uh, so this might be the real speed time profile. Uh, you can see that the, is this working? Starts at a kind of standstill. Uh, there's this increase in acceleration here to some constant acceleration. Uh, there's some constant speed if it's traveling far, far enough. And then there's a constant deceleration uh, and this, this kind of decrease in deceleration down to a standstill. Uh, those are 
derivatives of acceleration is called jerk. Uh, there's a jerk physics model which describes this. as lots of mathematical equations. Um, but we don't really want our developers spending time kind of solving complicated mathematical equations just for our simulation models. We want, remember, the purpose of this is for them to ask, test our software, uh, not to prove that they're great at math. So we might simulate the speed time profile like this. So this would be a much simpler set of equations. Uh, and uh, on the next slide, we'll show why we, what the sorts of things why we might use a simulated model like this for rather than a, the, the real model. So there's a certain type of simulation that we use a lot called discrete event simulation. Again, it's from Wikipedia. I'm not going to read this one out. But I want you to notice the very last thing that I've highlighted there, that the simulation can jump in time from one event to the next. This is really important for us because when we're simulating, say, a new warehouse design, we would want to run our code not just for half an hour. We would want to run it for days or maybe weeks to see how it performs. Does the warehouse really have the capacity over one week? And if we had a real-time simulation and we had to wait a week to get the answers, well, that's, that's really slow. So discrete event simulation is really powerful because it provides us a way of running a weeks of effective kind of code time in a much shorter time. And I've got an example to highlight that now. So we've got two lines here. The bottom dotted line is real time, so what you would observe on the clock on the wall. And we've got our simulation time, which is uh, like the time stepping on in our code. So imagine an event comes in. Uh, so red is for simulation, green is for kind of real software. So a bot would report its position. So our bots send us messages to tell them where they are. So it's saying, hey, I'm at x100. Uh, so going back to that uh, model that I showed you of the, of the speed time profile, we can actually calculate what the bot would say where it is by using those mathematical equations for speed and time to derive where the bot should be. So then our real code would receive that uh, message from the simulated bot, and it would run some code in response. And that would take some amount of real time. Now, when the next event comes in, rather than having to wait for this period between uh, kind of here and t, well, with a discrete event simulation, like I said, we can jump in time. And we can start processing that event straight away. Again, that will take some time. I mean, as you can see, it goes on in another position, so more code gets executed, et cetera, et cetera. And so rather than waiting 3t amount of time, we can actually process all of that code in a time which is, in this example, would be half of that time. So this is really powerful for us. Because like I say, it means we can get feedback much faster than we would be able to if we were running kind of real-time code. Uh, so kind of related to simulation uh, and related to the fact that we use it a lot to test our code and test new algorithms, we're really concerned with determinism as well. We really want our code to be deterministic. And the blunt point is that real-time systems are just not deterministic. There are too many random things going on in the world, time, CPU scheduling, threads, all sorts, that means that we can't, if we were running our real-time code, we wouldn't be able to get the same results again and again and again. And like I said, we want this in our discrete event simulation so our developers can test. They run these simulations in, in the IDE on their desktops, and so you really want them to run it once, and then when they run it again to get the same result, and when they run it again to get exactly the same result, so if you need to debug, you can step through and know that the next time you run it, you're going to get the same sequence of events. And determinism is so important for us that we test it in our CI pipeline. Uh, I mean, it's not a foolproof test, but we can run the same set of tests again and again and again to make sure we get the same output, because we've observed that any undeterministic behavior quickly spreads throughout the code base. So while it's not a surefire guarantee that our code is deterministic, definitely uh, helps us to catch things. And so I'm going to talk to you now about three areas that we've had to address determinism and why where Java kind of falls a bit short. Uh, time, scheduling, and iteration. So if we move on to time, I'm going to show you some code. So we had to introduce an interface like this called Time Provider because we can't rely on the kind of native calls you get in Java for finding time, current system time or nano time. 
Because like I said, every time you call that, you're going to get a different order. Time only goes in one direction. So we've had to introduce an interface so that in our discrete event simulations, we can control time. But yet in our real-time code, we can uh, use the real time as we wish. So this is what kind of a simple implementation of our time provider might look like. So you can see we've got our get time method, which is being overridden from our um, interface. But then most crucially, we've got a set time function. And this is important because this is what allows us to do that jumping in time, as I described. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing magic about this. This is uh, something quite simple. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is we had to introduce a, a new abstraction, something that doesn't exist in Java for something simple like title, so that we can be sure that we have kind of deterministic uh, discrete event simulations, but also have our undeterministic real-time production code. So here's an example of what that implementation might look like in our production code, you know, just forwarding on to the, the system calls. So let's talk about scheduling as well. You know, we, uh, for a similar thing, again, we can't rely on the built-in executor or executor service interfaces in Java, because again, they're just, they're just not deterministic. So again, we've had to introduce our own abstractions to allow us to have that deterministic production, uh, discrete event code and our real-time production code. Uh, sorry, that's a bit distracting. Uh, so two interfaces here, kind of simple, an, an event and an event scheduler. Again, nothing, nothing rocket science, but just an area where we've had to think a bit more and introduce our own abstractions to allow us to have determinism. And so this is what, uh, again, our implementation might look like in our discrete event simulation. Uh, and this is basically that example I stepped through but just in code form. So you can see we're maintaining a uh, you know, queue of events that we're pulling off. And then this is the bit here where we're jumping forward in time, setting the time to when the event is meant to be processed. We're executing that event, and then we're just getting the next one. And we loop around and keep going until we have no more events left. So like I say, that's just that example in, in code form. Uh, the, I'll show you what we do in real time in a bit. So, and then the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to determinism is iteration. So if you look at this bit of code, first quiz question of the day, can anyone tell me whether this is deterministic or not? Who thinks it is deterministic? <laughs> the answer's obvious, isn't it? Who thinks it's not deterministic? <laughs> Who doesn't have an opinion? <laughs> okay, so those who said no, why? That's the more interesting question. Why are you so confident that it's not deterministic? Anyone? Precisely, and how do you know that? You know Java, you've read the docs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's as simple as that, right? You have to read the documentation. Uh, and if you go and read the documentation for set.of, you'll find that this line, that the iteration order of elements is uh, not unspecified and subject to change. So you can't rely on it returning the same thing every time because the library creator has said that they're not supporting that. So this is the same example, just using immutable set from Guava. And yeah, this is deterministic. Again, you go and look at the, the documentation and you see that it says, except for sorted collections, order is preserved from construction time. So again, the library creators, in this sense, Google and in the Guava library maintainers have told us that they are uh, ensuring determinism. So that's simulation and determinism covered. So I'm going to move on to talk about some optimizations that we've had to perform in our control system. So like I said, we have a Java-based control system running in our, on our data centers. It's communicating with the robots 10 times a second. I said grid the size of three football pitches, about 3,000 robots. Uh, this thing needs to scale, needs to be performant, needs to be low latent, uh, all that good stuff that everyone wants to do when they're developing software. Before I go on and talk about any, some of the optimizations we've done, I want to put this quote up 
Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Sometimes this gets misquoted. Some people don't like it. I'm not going to get into that. But I think I, I like the, the essence behind it, I think. That for most of your code, you probably don't need to worry about optimization. Sure, don't go and implement an order n squared algorithm when you know an order n algorithm exists. I don't think it's saying that. I think it's if you do your uh, you do the kind of the best thing, you don't need to worry about profiling and optimizing uh, every last bit of your code. But I think sometimes this is taken out of its context. So this is that quote in the larger quote, and it's that last bit that I've highlighted. So it's saying you never should optimize. It's saying that you shouldn't. Most of the time, you shouldn't optimize. But you shouldn't pass up on the opportunities other than that critical 3%. And so I'm mentioning this because some of the optimizations and some of the things I'm going to show you that we've done now are not the sorts of things that we just apply everywhere in our code. These are the parts that we've had to apply and think about in the performance critical sections of our code, that 3%. So back to event scheduling. So our system has the following requirements. We need to schedule events for specific times. Individual events can't be arbitrarily delayed. And the system can't allow for events to be arbitrarily backed up. So you're all Java programmers. Ah, Java programmers here. Who of you are old enough to remember this class? Would you use this class anymore? No, good. What might you use? Yeah, you might use something like this, scheduled thread pool executor. Uh, and that's what we did, uh, and we saw how it performed. So let's talk about, go back to those three requirements again. So to schedule events for specific times, that's kind of in the name. It's a scheduled thread pool executor. It kind of matches that one. How about the next one? Individual events can't be arbitrarily delayed. Well, if we think about what happens when we schedule an event, depending on how you've configured your thread pool, how many threads you're allowing in it, what your min and max pool sizes are. What might happen when you, an event comes to be scheduled is that the thread pool executor decides, ooh, I want to create a new thread now because I haven't got enough. And so before your event gets processed, goes to the kernel and says, give me a new thread, please. That takes some time. The thread comes back, it has to instantiate it. So we can't control whether individual events are going to be arbitrarily delayed. It's kind of out of our hands. And the system can't allow events to arbitrarily back up. Well, if you know the scheduled thread pool executor in some detail, you dig into the source code, you find that it's using uh, an unbounded queue uh, for processing the events. So if you're sending too many events in and it can't keep up with the processing, then your events are just going to back up and back up and back up on this unbounded queue. So this doesn't actually meet the requirements uh, that we want. But how did we find this out? Well, we ran our simulations, we performance tested it, uh, and we understood why it wasn't doing what it was doing. So to solve this particular problem, go back to that code that I didn't show you earlier, we turned to a solution called a busy loop, or a, or a, a spin loop, or a wait loop. Now, if you go and Google this, common advice on the internet sort of says that you sh probably shouldn't do this. And I would agree, for most code, you don't want to do this. Because this is going to eat up a CPU. It's going to spin and spin and spin. For a lot of time, the CPU is not going to be doing anything. So you're wasting that resource where you could be doing other work. But for us, it means we can get our, our latencies down. Uh, and we can get a higher throughput of events through our system. So you can see here, there's a while true loop. It will go around forever and ever and ever and only process the event if the real time has passed the time when the event is due to be processed. So, yeah, some advantages. We got latency down from five milliseconds down to about zero. And in our system, we observed three times higher throughput of events. Some of the downsides, well, it will eat 100% of your CPU for sure. So you can't rely on kind of your CPU utilization graphs anymore because it will just be capping out 100%. We've got about four or five of these in our system, so we're constantly hitting four or 500%. So you have to rely on uh, maybe monitoring alerting or instrumentation to understand how your system is performing. And depending on what processor you're using, you might actually reduce the clock speed. 
and that's bad, but oh well, we, we, we're aware of these risks and we've weighed them up and we thought this is better for our use case than not doing it. Another tactic we use is memoization. Everyone know what memoization is? Basically caching, essentially. So we have two main flavors of caching that we use a lot. Kind of the standard caching, as I've called it. Essentially, you have a function, a pure function that always returns the same result. So on the first time you compute it, you save the result. Uh, every time you call it with the same inputs, you can just return the cached output. So that's good. It means we don't have to run that function again and again and again. Uh, and like I said, we kind of only do this in the performance critical bits, maybe on the, uh, the path to communication with our bots, where we need our, our code to run in a low latent way and return us a result really quickly. And so again, rather than doing this in the standard way of the first time you calculate or run the function, uh, you, you might incur that penalty, and then every subsequent call is quick. What often we do is actually at startup time, we're willing to take a bit of a penalty on our startup time and just calculate it for loads and loads of different input values. So that before we start actually communicating with our robots, we've got all of the kind of uh, expected values known up front. And a similar, in a similar way, we also do object caching. Uh, it's the same principle, but rather with than with functions, with object creation. So like I say, you, we saw our bots, they're running in X and Y. And no surprise, we have a coordinate object that holds an X and Y value. Uh, our grid, while it is very big, is not infinite. So there are only a finite number of valid coordinate objects. Uh, we use them everywhere. So rather than creating them and uh, every time we need to use them and then incurring the extra GC penalty, which then introduce pauses. I'll talk about GC in a bit. In that scenario, what we would do is we would just run through the entire coordinate space at startup, generate every possible coordinate object. It's an immutable object, which makes things easier. Store them in a cache. Then whenever we want to get that object, it's just a cache lookup. So we've removed uh, object creation time and we've uh, reduced pressure on our garbage collector. Again, these aren't things that you should do in all of your code. Don't, that's not what I'm saying, but we, we kind of analyzed our code, we've profiled it, and these are things for us which are helping us gain improved performance and make sure our, our system is running uh, as efficient as possible. So I've sort of mentioned profiling a bit. We do do profiling. Uh, we have a CI pipeline, like I hope everyone has. Uh, we're running our discrete event simulations, a, a big suite of them, every time someone commits some code, and we're tracking the performance of those simulations over time so that we don't check in code which de unintentionally degrades performance. Like I said, some of these tests take uh, 6, 12, 18 hours to run, so we can't expect a developer to run them all the time, so uh, the developers will have a smaller set of tests to kind of sanity check before they go into master, and then these will run overnight or over the weekend, and we can make sure that we don't deploy code that is unintentionally broken performance. So if performance is observed to drop, then someone has to go in and manually investigate. You whip out your favorite profiler, your kit, JVisual VM, uh, JMC, uh, and this is something you have to do on your, or kind of on your developer machine. You do some profiling, and then you realize what, you, what the problem might be, or you do some candidate improvements. Uh, and then we use JMH for actually benchmarking those improvements. I've heard JMH mentioned at quite a few talks today, which is nice. Uh, if you haven't been in any of those talks, here's what JMH is. This is taken from the OpenJDK site for JMH. It's basically a benchmarking framework. It uh, allows you to remove the possibility of falling into a lot of the pitfalls that uh, you can fall into very easily if you kind of do benchmarking yourself. Uh, so definitely recommend using it if you want to do any sort of benchmarking. So here's just a, kind of a, an example that, where we've changed some code through doing some profiling. Uh, again, this is kind of uh, code from JMH. I'm not going to talk too much. Basically, the main thing to think here is compute if absent. Uh, this line here. Uh, so only compute that thing if if it's absent. Uh, this is what we wanted to test it against. So basically checking whether the result is null first and don't doing the compute if absent. Uh, we can run this through a benchmark and we can see that if you do that, you get like nearly double the throughput. 
Again, this works in our application. We profiled it in our scenario. I'm not saying go away and replace all your compute if absent calls with that kind of template. But it's just a, a, a trivial example of something that we've done, uh, again, to improve our code and the sorts of things that our developers are doing on, on a day-to-day -day basis when they in incur issues. Garbage collection. Well, we love Java because it's a memory managed language. We don't have generally have to worry about freeing our objects. But garbage collection does introduce uh, some, some complications for us, especially in a soft real time system like ours. Uh, probably no surprise that it's the primary source of all our pauses. So here are some of the things that we've done, again, in our performance critical code to reduce the pressure on garbage collection. Removing optionals from APIs that are heavily used. Optional is just an extra object. Sometimes we don't need it. Using for loops instead of the streams API. Using a array data structure instead of a hash set or a linked list. Avoiding primitive boxing. Uh, and so the thing that these all have, an have in common is that they are creating extra objects. And we've had to go back to the more old school C++ C sort of way of doing things to reduce the pressure on the garbage collector uh, so that we're not having too many objects created, and then hence more pauses. Again, I'm going to keep irritating this point. Don't go through your code and start removing all your optionals. Optional is great. Optional signals intent about what your function is going to do and what it might return. But in performance critical code, sometimes that extra object can be a bit too much. So some tips for Garbage collection, always enable your GC logs. Uh, hopefully, I think that's obvious. You can't get them again. They're really cheap. Just enable them. Understand the different collectors, and don't just take the latest and greatest collector. Uh, I mean, there's at least four or five different collectors now in Java 11, uh, the oldest one being the throughput collector. So you might look and say, oh, GC, a ZGC has just come out. That's clearly going to be a better collector and just jump on it. Don't do that. Understand how your code works. If your software is uh, batch software that's running overnight, then the throughput collector is actually probably better for you. Uh, that said, we were interested in ZGC. Uh, and so we use G1GC in production. If you're not familiar with it, you can specify the pause time. Uh, and you trade off higher CPU usage uh, by the GC for lower throughput. As you can imagine, this is really important for us. We don't want our application to be paused for one minute doing garbage collection. Then our robots can't do anything. Uh, so we can specify the target pause time to make sure it's in the bounds that we like. ZGC was new in Java 11, experimental. But it promises pause times of about 10 milliseconds or, or lower. And for us, and it does that oh, sorry, on multiple gigabytes worth of heaps. And so for us, that's really interesting and, and something we wanna, uh, it wanted to explore. And one of the reasons why we really love using Java, because we can benefit from these new features in the latest version and get kind of performance gains for free. So we ran some of our simulations. Uh, and we looked at the GC logs uh, for G1 GC and ZGC. I think we ran like 12 hours worth of tests for each collector. And this is kind of the things we saw. So this is. On the y-axis is the pause time on a logarithmic scale. And we've got percentiles on the x-axis. Uh, so basically, the lower down on this graph you are, the better. Uh, so kind of take your attention to this point here, the 95th percentile. So basically, what this is saying is when running G1 GC, 1 in 20 of the pauses are more than about 50 milliseconds. Now, if you go along. So there? For ZGC, that's probably something like one in every 200 or something is greater than 50 milliseconds. The 95th percentile was down here and was about five, uh, yeah, five milliseconds. So one in 20, less than five. So that's massive for us. Just by upgrading to Java 11 and using a new garbage collector, we can gain uh, massive performance in terms of the uh, shortening the pause times. And you see this uh, in a different way by looking at your application throughput. So basically, here we're summing up all of the pause times. Uh, and so I'm just have to look at my notes. That's right. Basically, when running G1GC over a 12 hour test, the application wasn't doing anything for about seven minutes. 
That's a lot of time when your computer is just sitting there and you've given over your application time to the garbage collector. And for ZGC, that came down to about 1.5 minutes, one and a half minutes. So we'd gained six minutes of extra processing time for our application in a 12-hour period, which, again, is massive for us. Uh, so this is another challenge that we had uh, and sort of related to uh, garbage collection a bit. Uh, we run, like I said, we run our application in a data center. We use OpenStack. Uh, I'm not going to go too much details on what OpenStack is. We have on-premise compute and storage. Uh, yeah, historically, we ran our code on, on bare metal machines, uh, but there was a desire from our infrastructure team to kind of want to virtualize everything, uh, and we kind of wanted to not be the kind of black sheep and running on different infrastructure. We didn't want to manage our own infrastructure. So we were keen to get on the same infrastructure that was being offered by the common infrastructure team to reduce the burden on our developers. However, the default hypervisor is KVM. Uh, it's all right, but when we ran our tests, uh, we basically found a 6% performance drop. Now, 6% might not sound a lot, but for, that, for us, that's massive, and it wasn't acceptable. Uh, so we did some uh, analysis. Again, all these sorts of profiling analysis and graphs I'm showing you have all come from us being able to run simulations. Uh, the simulation enables us to run many days' worth of our code and analyze performance, all sorts of things, whatever we're interested in. So it's really powerful for us. So we could run the same simulation on a host of different sorts of uh, virtual machines. So the blue one, is this going to work? Yep, yeah, that's uh, bare metal. So uh, that was our old infrastructure. And that's basically saying that we had a pause of basically 0.5 seconds for every minute of running. Uh, we then benchmarked it by running on the same server that the OpenStack cloud was going to run on, just to get a uh, kind of a control group that's basically the same. These three up here are uh, some various different flavors of VMs. We were trying to tweak some parameters uh, to see if we could get better performance out of OpenStack. Uh, but we didn't really get much. You can see that it's basically twice as bad as uh, on bare metal. Uh, but down here, this one was the interesting one. This basically told us that the problem was that when we come to running uh, a virtual machine on a dual core, uh, a dual socket machine, so I probably should have said our servers are 32, normally 32 cores. They've got two CPU sockets. Um, modern CPUs use a memory architecture called NUMA, a non-uniform memory axis. Uh, so the CPUs have local uh, memory uh, to each socket. So there's a big penalty if you're trying to access memory on a different socket. So if your code's running on socket one and you want some memory that's local to socket two, uh, you're going to hit a big performance hit while your uh, CPU tries to get that memory from socket two and make it available to socket one. And that kind of was confirmed by the fact that when we ran an OpenStack test with just one socket, the RGC times dropped back down. So this is a bit of a conundrum. What do we do? We really wanted to get on the OpenStack infrastructure. We hated managing our own, our own infrastructure. We really wanted to get on the common, but the performance was not, just not there. So luckily, a technology called LXD came to the rescue. Uh, you can go and read up about it. It's basically a next generation system container manager. That's a quote from the canonical website for LXD. Uh, yeah, so essentially it's like Docker, but not Docker. Uh, so our code doesn't run in containers, but uh, it allows us to manage containers on, a on the virtual machine. So it kind of gives us the best of both worlds. We kind of get sort of the power of containers, and it has OpenStack integration or VMs, while also getting access to kind of bare metal performance. So we've got to have our cake and eat it. <laughs> So, I mean, I mentioned that one because it's not really about Java optimizations, but it's the sort of things that we have to concern ourselves with because, like I say, our simulations show drop in performance, we can't handle, and we're always making sure our system can be as performant as possible. So, for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to move on to talk about something different and talk about how we use Java to test our robot software. 
So we've got uh, quite a large number of teams, uh, some of them here in Sofia, writing embedded C code, which runs on our robots to control the motors, uh, control all the different hardware inside our robots. Uh, and we need to test that software. Uh, so you can write more C code to test your C code. But actually, what we do is we test it with Java. Uh, so why do we do that? Well, if you've ever been an embedded engineer, I've done a bit of C programming in my past, testing it can be really costly and slow, especially you have to, when you have to test it on the real hardware. You know, you have to, maybe you've got a test farm somewhere if you're right, whatever hardware you've got. You have to schedule some time to get some uh, access to that test farm. You have to put your code onto it. Uh, you know, you have to run your tests. Then the next person comes along and boots you off because they then want to run their test and you have to wait again. And it can just be really painful. And at Ocado, we really want to promote kind of agile development practices, continuous delivery. And we want to do that even for our embedded developers as well not just our Java developers or our Kotlin developers. We want all of our developers, regardless of the language they are kind of writing in, to be working in an agile way and practicing continuous delivery. And so in this example, we're not optimizing our code, but we're optimizing for developer speed, for fast feedback loops. And we want our, de our embedded developers to be like our Java developers. You know, when I moved from developing in C to the first time I started writing Java, I was just amazed by the power of the IDE that you get in the Java language. Seven, eight years ago, there wasn't really a great IDE for C, not compared to what you had in Java. But we want to give that power to our embedded developers as well. And we want to have them running their embedded tests in the IDE, just like a Java developer would. Yeah, and we use simulation to kind of address these problems. That should be a no surprise by now. So this is another diagram of our overview. We've got our Java control system on the left and our bot on the right, communication over wireless protocol. There's some PCBs inside our robot, PCBs that we designed. They're running some application logic, some uh, hardware kind of abstraction layers. They communicate with other PCBs, maybe uh, some motors, and there's some motion control software. Uh, they're going to be communicating with the battery and the battery management software. Uh, there's some other sorts of sensors on there and some control software and other kind of custom electronics for controlling those sensors. So when we're looking to simulate uh, a system, we have to decide which bits of the system we're going to simulate. And so remember, in this case, we're now not wanting to test the control system, we're wanting to test our bot software. So this is what we do when we are testing our control system. We have our real control system and our whole bot is just simulated. And this is one way that we might decide to break down a simulation for our bot software. We might decide that we're going to run every single bit of application code, the real code, and just simulate the, the raw hardware. Uh, so we've got some custom uh, ARM chips that we use in our bots. ARM provide chip emulators. Uh, so we could take some chip emulators from ARM, uh, and run our code against them. Uh, I've been informed that they're quite slow. You don't get the fast feedback loops, uh, various other things. You know, you could then maybe write a model to how your motors work. You could simulate how a battery works, do some chemical simulation analysis. Uh, but this is not actually what we do. Uh, what we do is this. Uh, and the reason we do this is because it's actually in this application logic where uh, most of our coding on a day-to-day -day basis happens. This is the fastest changing piece of code. It's the piece of code that we've got uh, the most developers working on. And so, like I say, we're optimizing for fast feedback and developer productivity. And so actually, this setup helps us achieve that much better. Uh, so here, we're simulating everything apart from the application logic written in C. And then it enables us to do things like this. Uh, so what I'm seeing, what I'm showing you here is uh, a scenario where we have our real control system in Java. And we can actually then run the application logic for our robots on different machines or on the same machine. And we can simulate a 1,000 robots, say, and run the real C code for those 1,000 robots and run it against our real control software in a simulated environment. And it's the use of Java and our common simulation framework which actually allows this to be possible. And this is really, really powerful for us. 
not only now are we simulating or testing kind of both parts of the system, the control software and the bots, separately, but we can actually integrate them and test the API and do integration testing in our office without having to go on hardware as possible. And this is the direction we're always trying to head in our system. We want to do as much testing in the office as possible and get that fast feedback loop. The more and more we can do in the office on servers and run real code and not have to touch hardware, the better for us. So I don't know if you've ever tried to integrate Java and C. Maybe you've used JNI or JNA. But often what you have to do is you have a header file in C. Your developer then has to sit and write some code and turn that into a class file or Java file. And that's fine if you've got one or two headers. Like I say, if you've got multiple header files, again, your developer can sit there, bash out some custom code to get you your Java classes to correspond with those headers. But what do you do if you've got hundreds of header files? Are you really going to make your developer just repeat them to turn them into 100 or more custom Java classes? If you did that, you'd probably have a developer looking a bit like this. <laughs> so like I said, we, we, we're optimizing in this case for developer productivity. We want our developers to be happy, to be fast, for writing feature code, not just doing mundane boilerplate code, stuff like this. So luckily, if you go and read the uh, web page for JNA, they give a nice shout out to this JNerator utility. I'm not really sure how you pronounce that. <laughs> but this is quite a nice tool. You can go and look at it, and it will automatically generate your class files based on your header files. And that's great for, product, uh, for developer productivity. And then that points you to this other library, which is uh, talking about uh, how you bind your C and your Java code together. And open source software is it's amazing, right? People have solved these problems, and we can uh, ride, uh, kind of stand on the shoulder of giants, as it were. And so, I'm going to whiz through this because I'm nearly at time. Sorry. So, we have our, how say, we have our C code, and we compile them into static objects. Uh, multiple static object files compiled into two executables, one for each of the chips that run our application logic. We've got some C++ too. We write Java for our test cases and Java for our hardware simulation. And so there's two different ways we can go about setting up this integration environment for running our tests. This is the most obvious and where we started. So we have a single JVM. We have our tests written in Java. We have our hardware simulation written in Java. We have a static object library for doing some communications. And then our kind of C code is running outside the JVM in separate processes. Uh, this is pretty good. Uh, it's really easy to set up. Uh, it keeps your memory spaces separate for your C code. However, when we did this, we found out that it was kind of really slow. Turns out there were a lot of messages going along these two channels. Uh, and again, our tests were running really slowly. And again, we were, in this case, optimizing for developer productivity. So we moved to this scenario, where again, we got the same tests written in Java, but this time loading all the static objects into memory and having our hardware simulation written in Java as well. Uh, this is better. It's faster. It runs our tests quicker, uh, but also has some downsides as well, some fiddly notions around memory isolation, because now you've got multiple static objects in the same JVM, which are uh, assuming separate memory spaces. So what it turns out we had to end up doing is actually maintain both of these setups. Uh, some scenarios are better for the first one, and some are better for the second one. Uh, quickly going to run over this, uh, try and keep in the last two minutes. So some of the challenges that you get when you try and integrate Java and C is that the garbage collector is only limited to Java code. It can't see inside your C code. So you've got your C code running a JVM. The garbage collector can happily run over all your Java code. But if your C code's got a memory leak, well, then tough. Your garbage collector can't handle that. Your C code can pass back bad objects. It could pass back an array of size 10, uh, and which is in an object of size 5 or something. Uh, basically, there's no, none of the nice encapsulation in C. So you can, like I say, really shoot yourself in the foot uh, and, and break your Java code quite easily. Testing asserts in C code is quite interesting. Uh, so an assert will just cause a crash uh, or an interrupt. Uh, but we really want to test the certs, actually. We want to test our failure cases. It's where we find probably the most bugs. 
So we want to make sure that we're able to test uh, when our C code asserts and not crash our whole JVM. And so how we had to get around that, again, was introducing more abstractions uh, to enable us to do things like this. Uh, JVM startup time is a problem. Uh, it takes a long time to load in these DLLs and these static object files. And again, we are optimizing for developer productivity. Uh, and there's some issues around JUnit 5 and parameterized tests. I've got 30 seconds left. I'm going to whiz through this. So to summarize, <laughs> grocery is a really difficult sector to run online profitably. We use Java in our warehouses to help us do this. We use simulation everywhere. We've had to introduce many different sources of abstractions to allow us to have deterministic code for tests and research, but to have kind of real-time production code. And we also use Java in a kind of a novel use case for testing our embedded C software. And yeah, start simple, test measure, and optimize when necessary. Thank you very much for listening to me. Just in time. There's no one coming after me, so maybe I can take some questions. Maybe everyone just wants to go and drink cocktails. Yeah, one question over there. Do we do what, sorry? Ha, ah, do we do hardware in the loop simulation uh, or hardware in the loop testing? Yes. Uh, hardware in the loop is an area where uh, oh, sorry, yes, good point. Uh, hardware in the loop is where you would have, like, say, a PCB, a real PCB, and you, can, uh, test, you would test your code on that PCB maybe as part of a, a continuous uh, CI pipeline or something. So actually introducing real testing into your office-based uh, testing setup. So yes, something we're doing with our custom PCBs, we're looking to uh, maybe set up like a, a a farm of custom PCBs and hook that up to our CI pipeline so we can actually run our code on the real hard on the real PCB hardware, not obviously in the real bot, uh, and do that again in the office before we put it into our test facility to test on the real robots. Yeah. Again, yeah, we're basically looking to do as much in the office as possible, essentially. Anything else? Anyone else? One in the front here? So how do you avoid the crashes of the robots with the GC in place? Ah, so, so you, are you asking when the GC pauses and our application isn't running, how do we stop our robots from crashing? Uh, so that's a very good question, very insightful. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to skip on that question, unfortunately, sorry, yeah, that's a part of our secret sauce, but, uh, we do, it's definitely something we've had to consider, of course, because using Java when the GC is not running, our code isn't running, so it's not controlling the robots. So yeah, we, we definitely had to think about it. We solved that. Uh, can't really tell you how we've done that, sorry. <laughs> cool, I'll call it there. I'll let everyone get away and drink some cocktails. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hope you've enjoyed J Prime Conference. <laughs>